this next session we have a lot of uh, oh thank you we have a lot of materials we're going to get through we have multiple speakers so you'll be glad to hear you don't have to listen to me prattle on for much longer so um, welcome so for the people who just joined us this is the second of the uh, Kronos uh, boffs today uh, you just missed the vision processing boff which was awesome Victor did an awesome job over there and then uh, this is the OpenCL boff next is the WebGL boff and after that uh, the native 3D boff so we hope you can join us for as many that are interesting to you uh, let's talk about OpenCL and together with the companion uh, APIs uh, and framework Spear and Circle. Um, and again, there's some duplication with what I just said, and I hate doing the same slides twice, but I only have a few slides, so it's gonna be over, and then we'll get some more interesting speakers up here. Uh, but there are some new folks in the room. Um, so for Kronos, for those of you who haven't come across us, we're an open standards organization. We do graphics compute, uh, vision processing, we do APIs that are royalty free, close to the silicon. Uh, our, our mission, our passion is to uh, enable software developers to use the cool stuff uh, that our chips are uh, capable of. We have everyone from Apple and Google, Intel, NVIDIA, all the way down to um, individual software developers. And you know, we welcome people joining Kronos. This stuff is interesting. So OpenCL. Um, OpenCL is a framework for heterogeneous parallel programming. That means you can write an application that takes use of any of the parallel compute resources that you have on the system. You might have a multi-core CPU, you might have one or more GPUs, DSPs, uh, particularly if you're in a mobile phone increasingly, FPGAs, um, and OpenCL is a single framework that lets you write small kernels in a C or C++-like kernel language uh, interrogate those resources with an API. You can find out what's there and then use a second API to build those kernels, compile them, distribute them across the available processors as you want. You get the control and to bring back uh, the results. And in the OpenCL group, what we've been working on for a long time is OpenCL 2.2. Uh, the key thing in OpenCL 2.2, as we'll see in a second, is we have uh, uh, C++ as the kernel language. Before OpenCL 2.2, it was OpenCLC, but now we have, uh, have the choice. And as Ben is gonna be explaining, you know, the C++ gives you better programming elegance and reusability, but also the chance to do better uh, uh, performance portability, because you can have uh, metaprogramming and dynamically adapting code uh, to suit the, uh, the hardware that you're running on. We have a number of uh, implementations of OpenCL uh, coming in waves. The desktop tends to be first. Um, we uh, have now the first 2.1 implementations. So the spec 2.1 shipped in November 15. So it's actually not that long ago, just a few months ago. Uh, but the first specification from Intel is already shipping. On mobile, tends to follow uh, like a year or two behind. Um, the, the sweet spot on mobile right now is 1.2. Uh, Qualcomm has the first 2.0 implementation, uh, and that uh, shipped November, November 15, that's not quite right. I, I need to change that slide. But it's, it shipped a couple, month or two ago, right? I think, Alex, yeah. Um, FPGAs, is it, wow. You can run that, OpenCL on FPGAs. We can, Open, OpenCL 1.0 is now running conformantly on FPGAs and you can get good performance for uh, a good class of applications and embedded. Uh, the DSP vendors like TI and Marvell increasingly shipping OpenCL 1.2. Um, so you're getting pretty good coverage. OpenCL 2.2, which the guys are gonna be talking about, um, it's not just OpenCL. The OpenCL has the API plus the definition of the OpenCLC and OpenCLC++. Spear is the intermediate representation that Kronos defines. Um, it's like LLVM for GPUs, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and then uh, the guys will go into much more detail. Sickle is a single source programming framework. You can write a single uh, source file, contains both the CPU and the GPU code in one source file using standard C++14, no uh, additions to the language, and the Sickle system will figure out how to accelerate your code for you. 
So Spear V, it's one of the most interesting things that Kronos is doing. I think it's, it's transforming how we can have parallel innovation on the runtime side, split from the front-end compiler side. So Spear V is an intermediate representation that has native representation for uh, graphics and parallel computation. It complements LLVM. We love LLVM. And many of the tool chains, including our own, bounce in and out of LLVM because there's a lot of value, of course, in LLVM. We're trying hard to be good players in the, in the ecosystem and having Spear V and LLVM CPUs, GPUs, um, cooperating in a good way. Um, but with uh, OpenCL 2.2, uh, we needed to upgrade Spear V to 1.1. So we have the constructs we need for C++ support. And in terms of the tools, we've already have released an open source assembler disassembler for Spear V. Um, and we're very close to having a Spear V uh, validator, which is important because of many, we hope and expect many people to do front ends uh, for different languages, generating Spear V that can be ingested by the various runtimes. And you know, that validator step is good to make sure that those front ends are uh, generating correct code. Uh, Sickle for OpenCL, we have a lot more detail in a second, but just the, the headline, as I mentioned, it's a single source programming framework. It's based on C14. The kind of comment I wanted to make at the ecosystem level, as we mentioned in the last uh, buff, was as well as providing really cool, easy to use programming um, uh, flexibility, the, it's important because this is the main attach point we have to the world of standard C++ in ISO. Uh, I think the ISO guys are really trying to figure out how to bring parallel programming into standard C++. Obviously, we've done a lot of work from the Kronos side on how to do that already. And we're trying to converge rather than diverge um, those efforts. And Sickle is really the main vector that we have to engage and converge with the uh, broader C++ uh, community. Some of the roadmap discussions um, in OpenCL, just to kind of give a kind of heads up before we dive down into present day details, we're looking to see what the requirements are from these specific verticals. Um, certainly we have OpenCL running on desktop. Uh, op OpenCL runs in big iron, supercomputers, and, and, and the cloud. And then we mentioned FPGAs. The typical use cases there are network and stream processing, and increasingly embedded. Uh, signal and pixel processing, uh, and of course mobile. Each of these have slightly different requirements, embedded in mobile, for example, and running neural nets actually require less precision than we have today. Today, OpenCL mandates IEEE floating point. Some of those application areas actually don't need that much precision. And so you know, if you were to do a profile of OpenCL for accelerating neural nets or for doing just vision processing, now, we might be able to dial back to precision. Now, of course, other segments absolutely need the precision. That's why we put it in there in the first place. So we're looking at potentially learning from Vulkan and folding some of the stuff that we have in OpenCL into Vulkan. I think there's going to be quite a rich uh, flow to and fro between both Vulkan and OpenCL. But I think the two will remain distinct. Uh, because Vulkan is going to remain a GPU API, that's my guess anyway, um, whereas OpenCL is going to remain a heterogeneous programming framework that copes with CPUs, GPUs, DSPs, FPA, FPGAs, and more and more architectures. Um, but it certainly would be good to bring perhaps some of the compute capabilities from OpenCL into Vulkan and, and to learn for example, feature sets from Vulkan, where you have a single coherent framework, but you ena enable different platforms and markets to turn off the bits that aren't relevant to them. Uh, that might be a kind of good path forward to make OpenCL more flexible and more suited to vertical markets uh, without uh, fragmentation and without disrupting the coherent whole of the uh, framework design. So that's kind of the ecosystem introduction and I'm almost not late. So the speakers that we have, um, we have Ralph from Coplay who's going to talk about Spear V and the latest version, 1.1. Ben from Intel is going to give us a deep dive into OpenCL um, C++, the new kernel language. 
Uh, Luke from CoPlay is going to dive into Sickle 2.2. That's the companion to OpenCL 2.2. Have Matthias from Tampere, uh, University of Technology, is going to talk about Pockle, which is a open source implementation of OpenCL. Uh, Alex and Jeff from Qualcomm are going to be talking about a neural net application on mobile running on Snapdragon 820 using OpenCL. And then Ben's going to join us at the end talking about a, uh, the latest Intel code generator tools for OpenCL. And then we should have time for questions. So without further ado, let's uh, invite Ralph. Thanks, Neil. So I'm Ralph Potter. I'm a research engineer at CodePlay, where I do most of my work on programming models for heterogeneous systems. So today I'm going to talk a bit about Spear V, this common shader IR for OpenCL, Vulkan, and now as of this week with a, an extension OpenGL as well. So I'm going to cover what is Spear V, how does it differ from the old Spear that, ex that we've already had for OpenCL, um, what we have to do to support multiple different APIs in a single IR, a quick example of what Spear V looks like, what a module looks like, run you through how you generate, manipulate, consume Spear V, and then a quick overview of what came for Spear V 1.1, what we had to provide to support C++ in OpenCL. So what is Spear V? It's a compiler IR for OpenCL and Vulkan as core. You can rely on it being there and available for OpenGL via this, the ARB GL Spear V extension. It's easy to parse. It's just a stream of 32-bit words. It's easy to transform. We, can we have a, uh, transformation tools to take it to and from LLVM IR. It's easy to manipulate because it's single static assignment, which for the compiler guys means we know what we're doing when it comes to optimizing. The original version was announced at Supercomputing in November of last year. 1.1 was at iWockle in April this year. Um, so 1.1 in particular is, is pretty new stuff. So we already had Spear in OpenCL. So we already had a way to generate a kind of binary intermediate representation from various source languages. But it was derived from LLVM 3.2's IR with some extensions and restrictions to accommodate OpenCL. And that introduces a few kind of rough edges. LLVM's IR is essentially documented by LLVM itself. The, the only reference is you go to LLVM 3.2 and you look in the source code and that's LLVM IR, which is fine. But if LLVM moves forward, now your tool chain is locked to that particular version of LLVM and we can't change it because there are drivers out there that already consume this thing. So you start having to backport bits and pieces of the compiler tool chain and it's, it's not ideal. Um, it was also optional on OpenCL. So, you, so yes, there were a lot of drivers that supported Spear, but not everybody did. So if you wanted your application to run everywhere, you probably still needed to generate OpenCLC. So on Spear V today, first of all, it's completely defined by Kronos. It's its own standalone spec. It doesn't depend on anything else. We have a shared core IR for the stuff that is common to both OpenCL and Vulkan and any other runtimes that might be coming down the pipe with an, with an ability to extend it for the specific needs of runtimes. So OpenCL has very high precision uh, math operations, for example, much higher precision than Vulkan needs because in graphics we can get away with fudging in a lot of cases and in scientific compute you probably can't. Um, so as I've referred to, it's core in OpenCL and Vulkan. It's now, as of announced this week, available via extension for OpenCL. Um, each runtime API defines an environment specification and that's just a set of flags that say these capabilities will be available on your runtime. An obvious one is OpenCL says you will have pointers available inside your kernels. Vulkan says you will use logical addressing inside your kernels. Every instruction in Spear defines what capabilities it requires. 
So in your module, you're going to declare what capabilities your module requires based on what your instructions required. You'll declare what the memory model of your runtime is. You will import an, an extended instruction set based on your runtime that pulls in the OpenCL built-ins or the GLSL built-ins for your module. And in that way, we can have a core IR, but still the ability to extend for the particular runtime environment that we're operating in. So I'm going to take us through a quick example of how a Spear V module builds up based from that kind of classic vector addition kernel that we've all seen in OpenCL. So we, we start by declaring the capabilities that we're going to require for an OpenCL kernel. We need physical addresses, we need pointers, we need the kernel capability, that sort of thing. We're going to import the OpenCL built-in library, so we have it, access to all the OpenCL standard functions. We're going to need get global ID, for example. Um, we declare that we're going to use OpenCL's physical addressing model, in this case the 32-bit version. We declare a few decorations that are going to subtly manipulate some of our variables. So one of our variables is now going to be the global ID. Uh, we also add some decorations to the kernel function and to its arguments. We declare what types we're going to need inside the kernel. So the kernel returns void, so we need type void. We've got some integer arguments, so we need type int. We declare all of that so the compiler knows what we're going to be dealing with in the back end. We declare this variable that represents our global ID, and then we declare the kernel function. And that's the full Spear V kernel for this, or the Spear, full Spear V module for this particular very trivial kernel. So there's a bunch of ways that we can generate Spear V. Some of them have been alluded to previously. We can generate Spear V from OpenCLC or C++ or Sickle by going through Clang and then the Spear V LLVM project that's on the Kronos GitHub. We could do it from for our own custom languages, where we could either go to LLVM, if that's how you want to build your compiler, or we could go direct to Spear V, if that's how you want to go. Um, on the graphics side, GLSL Lang currently supports GLSL, and there's been some work on HLSL as well. Again, going from their compiler direct to Spear, or Spear V. So Kronos have released several tools to do with manipulating Spear V. At the very base level, there are language bindings that declare all the constants that you would expect. What, what is the particular 32-bit number that a particular instruction maps to? All that stuff is in the Spear V headers. If you want to build your libraries from the most base level, you want to build a Spear V parser by hand rather than using what's already out there, then start here. Above that, there's the Spear V Tools repository, which has a library that contains an assembler, a disassembler, a validator, a binary parser for Spear V. That re repository has both library forms if you want to integrate them into your application, and command line tools if you want a command line assembler and disassembler to run yourself. There's also an LLVM backend repository if you want to be able to take Spear V and import it into LLVM, run their optimization passes, do your transformations, or if you want to be building your own front-end language on top of LLVM, then you probably want to start from that repository and that version of LLVM. Uh, I believe that's currently on LLVM 3.6, but I might be wrong on that one. So how do we consume Spear V? Each of the three APIs have their own entry points that are consistent with their own API standards. So in OpenCL 2.1, we got this create program with IL. Worked in a very similar way to how create program with binary or create program with source that you've already seen in OpenCL. You just pass it at the binary form of a Spear V module. It gives you back a CL program and you carry on querying what kernels exist and what have you, as you already would do in OpenCL. Vulkan obviously has its only entry points for creating shaders. The, the create shader module function takes a, this create info struct and there's a member of that where you just plug in your binary Spear V module. And for, for GL, the GL shader binary function has just been extended with a new binary format. So you just pass another flag that says 
this binary blob I'm giving you is sphere v, and the runtime will sort it out if you have the extension turned on. So what's new in sphere v? It's primarily features for OpenCL 2.2. Um, quite a lot of them are to do with C++. Um, the first thing we get is instructions to deal with named barriers. So you can now construct barriers that wait on two subgroups instead of a whole work group, um, which now means that if you're careful, you can start putting barriers inside branches and that sort of thing. You still have to make sure you don't deadlock it. You can't do it at less than subgroup granularity, but there's a bit more flexibility there. Instructions for querying the mapping between subgroups and workgroup sizes so that you can tell what size of work you're going to dispatch or how many subgroups you're going to end up with. Instructions to do with pipe storage for, for program scope pipes in OpenCL. So, so there is this issue with a, with a pipe that you can declare a global variable in, in a C++ kernel, but that global variable doesn't come to exist until the program object comes to exist, and then your pipe is going to exist for that period of time. Program scope pipes give us that. We also have a way to annotate kernel entry points as initializers and finalizers, because if you're going to do C++ in a kernel language, you need to be able to call constructors, and you need to be able to call them in the right way. So we now need to be able to annotate entry points to make sure those constructors are triggered. Um, and also some instructions to deal with loop optimization and independence inside loops and just helping the compiler there. So to summarize, I've given you a bit of an overview of Spear V, the differences between it and the previous version of Spear, our support for multiple APIs, an example, a quick run through how we generate and manipulate Spear, and a very rapid overview of what's new in Spear V. And with that, I'll hand over to Ben, I think. We're good. Ah, so thanks, Ralph, and thank all of you for taking time out of your day to come and hear about OpenCL and the OpenCL C++ kernel language. So I'm going to give an overview of the C++ kernel language, which I think is the key feature for OpenCL 2.2. And uh, before I begin, I wanted to thank some of my colleagues as well. My name's on the slides and I'm here, but I couldn't have done this without Bartek, who's also the C++ spec editor, and Adam, uh, who's helped a lot with the content in these slides. So we've talked a little bit about the C++ kernel language previously, but not in much detail. So what exactly did we do? Uh, at a high level, we took the OpenCLC kernel language that we're all familiar with and we know and love, or perhaps slightly hate, um, but it's based off of C99, so it's a little bit dated, and we've upgraded it so it's now based off of C++14, so it's, it's based off of a more modern programming language. Uh, it is a subset of C++14, and I suppose that begs a couple of questions right off the bat. Um, the first one is why a, why a subset, and the reason why is OpenCL is targeted at a wide variety of devices, everything from host CPUs that are very capable and that have been programming C++ or running C++ code for some time, um, all the way down through GPUs, FPGAs, DSPs, and we wanted as many of these devices to support C++ as possible. So we've constrained it slightly. Uh, you won't be able to run all of your C++ code through OpenCL, but we hope that you'll be able to run a large amount of it, enough to do very useful things. Um, the second question is, well, what's in and what's out? And, um, at a high level, the, the usual C++ suspects are, are in. So you can have classes, uh, you can have templates, you can have lambdas, you can overload functions, and you can overload operators, all the things that you know and love from C++ programming. Uh, Niels mentioned this lets you write very elegant code. It also lets you write very uh, fast code. And because it's a constrained subset, you should have confidence that your OpenCL C++ code should run at least as well as the OpenCLC code, if not better. So um, use this. Don't, don't, don't not use it. Uh, we're really excited about templates in particular. We've heard a lot of requests from programmers. They want to write templates in their OpenCL kernels, and we're really excited to see what people are going to be able to do with templates. Um, because we've upgraded our language, we can also upgrade our OpenCL standard library. So OpenCL 2.x or 2.0 uh, 
uh, has had this wide library of OpenCL built-in functions, but um, they've all had to been described in a C way because OpenCL has been a C programming language. Uh, since we're using OpenCL C++ now, we can make this much more modern, we can make it much more type safe, we can simplify some of the syntax, and some examples of this are atomics. Uh, previously, the atomics were C11 based, uh, now we have C++ atomics. Uh, some of the image built-in functions got upgraded, so they're now more type safe. Uh, it's a little bit more obvious what's going on. Device and queue in particular previously used the block syntax because we were based on OpenCLC. Now it's based off of lambdas. And uh, some other more minor things like the math functions for relaxed math and native math are now in their own namespace. So it's a little bit more cleaner and a little bit more obvious what's going on. As far as what's out, uh, it's anything related to functions or function pointers at a high level. So virtual functions are out, uh, exemptions are out, type identification's out. Uh, the full C++ standard library, um, we're not implementing that, but uh, we have impl implemented parts of the C++ standard library, and we've given a lot of tools and, and functionality, so if there is some part of the C++ standard library that, that you like, um, you should be able to implement a large amount of that yourself. So there's a real high level question that we've heard a lot even internally with Intel is, you know, I know OpenCLC and I'm happy with it and I also know C++, so how much of a change is this gonna be? And um, bottom line is if you know both languages, if you're a C++ ninja and you've written millions of lines of OpenCLC code, uh, OpenCLC++ should be familiar, should be intuitive, it should be easy to learn. If you know one or the other, but perhaps not both, uh, it should be a natural extension and it should be, again, pretty easy to learn. And obviously, if you don't fall into either one of those camps, um, you're still welcome here and we'll give you tools and, and hooks and documentation and tutorials so you'll be able to learn. I wanna spend most of the rest of my talk going through a couple of examples just to show the similarities and differences between OpenCLC and OpenCLC++. So we're gonna start off with a a very simple case. This is kind of the hello world of, of uh, OpenCL where we're just gonna copy an array. And at the start, you can see that there's a lot of similarities between the two. Um, side by side, they, they actually look kind of the same if you squint your eyes, but there are a few key differences. Uh, the first one is that we've added include files, they're an include mechanism in OpenCL. So much like your host code, your host C++ code, uh, if you wanna uh, use specific parts of the language, you'll just include the, the uh, files that include that functionality. So in this case, we're using OpenCL work item functions like get global ID, and we're also using some class wrappers, uh, so we're including the OpenCL memory header file. The kernel arguments is a demonstration of how we were able to uh, express concepts in the OpenCL programming language without extending the language versus in OpenCLC uh, we did have to extend the C language. So in OpenCLC, we added these address-based modifiers. So that's what the global qualifier is there. Um, and that's not actually part of the, the C language. On OpenCLC++, we were able to accomplish the same thing with a templated class. So we have this global pointer class. Uh, it's not extending the C++ language. Um, it looks a little different, but it accomplishes the same thing. The work item functions themselves, no real changes there. Um, the only thing you'll notice is that all of the OpenCL built-in functions are now in the CL namespace. So um, previously it was just get global ID, now it's got a CL namespace as well. But other than that, the code's basically the same. Uh, the, the contents of the kernels specifically are, are almost exactly the same. It's just a little bit of the fluff around it. I wanted to do an example with images because this shows some of the uh, additional enhancements to the OpenCL standard library that we, we were able to use because we're, we're a C++ language now. Um, so uh, a couple of, you know, right off the top, we're, we're including the OpenCL image uh, header file now because we're using image built-in functions. Um, just for conciseness, I've uh, um, included all of the CL functions in their namespace, so I don't have to clutter up the slides and hopefully that'll be a little bit clearer. So you can just imagine that all the CL namespaces are still there. Uh, for the image themselves, they're now templated classes. 
Um, again, previously in OpenCLC, we had to invent these new concepts of access qualifiers. So we had to invent this read-only access qualifier, and that applied to the image 2D type. In OpenCLC++, this can now be a template parameter. So um, when you declare your image, you, you say whether it's uh, uh, sampleable or writable. And that's, uh, again, just another template parameter. I'll also have you notice there's a float for, so the image has a type there, and that's the type that the image is going to return. We'll hold that thought and we'll come back to that in a little bit. The samplers themselves, not much change there. They're, they're still classes. Uh, when it comes time to have vectors like int twos, um, previously it was uh, done with an assignment. So you would declare your int two and then you'd have to assign it to something. Um, now a vector is a class and it has a constructor syntax and you can use that. It cleans up your code a little bit. The image built-in functions themselves, the image query function uh, for getting the image width is now a member function of the image class. So you don't have to pass that to a free function. It's now just a, a member function of the class. And this is actually one of the more interesting things. Previously, you had to kind of know and remember that uh, this particular image was returning floats. So I had to call read image f and um, get the version that returned floats. Uh, if you remember in the declaration of the image parameter or the image argument, um, we, we, we specified the type at that time. And we don't have to remember that anymore. Instead, we can just call the sample function. And, and because it's a float for image, we know that we're going to get back floating point data. Uh, last but not least, I did want to give a template example because I think this is one of the most requested features and, and I'm happy that we're now able to provide it. Uh, so here's an example. It's using templates and there's no OpenCLC equivalent here just because you couldn't do this previously. Um, so we do have a templated function. This is a, a helper function. It's not a kernel function, but it's something that the kernel functions can call. Uh, it's templated and it's an add vector function and it's going to be able to add vectors of arbitrary uh, vector size, so vec 2s, 3s, 4s, 8s, um, and also uh, vectors of arbitrary type, so integers or floats. Um, the kernel functions themselves cannot be templated and they can't be overloaded. You can almost think of these as being uh, functions that are uh, exported from a library and so you can't overload those. Um, so we do have to have two kernel functions. Uh, one of them is the, the entry point to add vectors of floats, and the other one is to add vectors of ints. But inside of those kernel functions, they can just call the same templated function. And this is going to work. Uh, it doesn't matter um, in the first case that the parameters are pointers to floats, or in the second case that the parameters are pointers to ints. And I have verified uh, this, this does work, so uh, pretty cool. I do want to wrap up and give a quick summary and a bit of a status. And um, the C++ kernel language spec is still provisional. And what that means is that if you have feedback and um, you find things that you think should be fixed before the spec goes final, uh, please let us know. There is a link to provide feedback on the Kronos forums. Um, and we would be happy to get your feedback uh, to have the spec be as, as good as possible before it goes final. Uh, the other piece that I'm really excited about is there's an open source C++ compiler that you can go out and you can get and uh, you, could, you could try right now. Um, it's on the Kronos GitHub. It builds upon the LLVM to SpearV converter that um, Ralph talked about previously. Uh, and I've actually compiled the three examples that I've given in this, in this talk with the open source compiler and, and I've verified that the SpearV file that gets produced is doing what I expect it to do. Um, the compiler has two capabilities. Uh, it can emit SpearV 1.0. So if you happen to have an OpenCL 2.1 device and you're not using all of the OpenCL 2.2 features that require SpearV 1.1, uh, you can use it to emit SpearV 1.0 and you can actually run that on an OpenCL 2.1 implementation. Um, if you want to use some of the new fancy OpenCL 2.2 functionality, obviously you won't be able to do that and you'll need a 2.2 runtime. So uh, I think that's the end of my talk. Over to Luke.
Thanks. Right. So um, I'm Luka Wonski. Um, for the last few years, I've been working with um, different types of applications, uh, including compute um, type of applications, the graphics and the vision. Uh, and as a my tool, uh, I've decided to to use uh, SQL. Um, so yeah, today I'm gonna bring up. Um, I'm going to showcase uh, some of the new features of SQL 2.2, uh, which I think are quite useful. Um, so the presentation shouldn't take more than 15 minutes. And uh, before jumping into the features, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, what's our aim with SQL 2.2 and, and general SQL is uh, where it fits in the uh, ecosystem. Um, then I'm going to cover these features, and I'll close up with um, a couple of um, use cases. I'm looking at, at Victor and it's like, do I have a question? <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, and I'm guessing the questions are at the end of the session. So, uh, yeah, or if you have anything, just, just ask them. So um, our aim with a SQL is um, single source modern C++ programming model um, exposing OpenCL 2.2 feature set. Um, that was very well uh, covered by, by Neil. Um, well, I wanted to add to that is we wanted to follow the current C++ standard um, uh, developments and enhance integration of OpenCL with developments in C++ standard. What that means is we want to follow both sides. Um, if C++ moves to C++ 19, 20, 22, uh, or uh, op uh, OpenCL 3.10 or whatever, we, we will be following this, this standard and so we'll be bringing the gap uh, together, like the closer together, both the standards. Um, we wanted to enhance the Kronos ecosystem and targets PRV 1.1 for uh, compute. Um, we want to provide the full and seamless uh, backward compatibility with uh, previous versions of SQL, uh, at the moment 1.2. And um, our, well, from this slide, our main um, takeout is the, the feedback. We wanted to create the tools that you as a developers will be um, happy with. So if you, if you have any, any feedback, or suggestions, um, let us know. Um, so yeah, um, another of this, this, this images, um, I wanted to just very uh, quickly recap on where um, where the SQL it fits in an in a, um, ecosystem. So in the ideal world, we would write the application from scratch aiming for our platform to get the most of the performance, but then legacy uh, code happens and, you know, reality in general. So um, porting the whole code base is almost impossible um, to, to do. So we found out that SQL fits very well underneath and uh, under, un, under the layer of uh, libraries, ideally templated libraries, because SQL lets you do the C++, um, modern C++, et cetera, et cetera. And then that goes to compile down to OpenCL devices via Spear or, or anything else. Um, so yeah, uh, let's move on with that. Um, so let's talk about some of the, the features, some of the new features. Uh, wow, I'm speeding through that. Um, so first of all, um, there is something called SQL command group. Um, the command group um, is required for, uh, in a SQL program to um, make the application run correctly, do all the synchronizations, uh, memory allocations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it, is very important for us to actually let us know the um, let, let developer know and let developers specify what um, what is under the hood, what OpenCL implementation um, he uh, what the OpenCL features he can use, and that can be done using the execution handle. So you can uh, pass in um, the template argument to execution handle, specifying what is under the hood. Um, so next uh, interesting thing is nested parallelism. Uh, what that means basically, you can uh, enqueue subkernels um, from within the kernel. So if we have a kernel that runs on a GPU and we want to um, spawn something uh, on that GPU, this is one constraint that has to, the, the subtasks will be running on that device, but they'll be running as a um, asynchronous in relation to parent kernel. So that's quite cool. We skipping this whole overhead, overhead or minimizing it. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, SQL hierarchical parallelism. 
Um, the hierarchical parallels is not new, uh, new feature. Um, the, the parallel for, for work group um, and parallel for work item was in the SQL 1.2, but what um, SQL 2.2 brings in is this thing in the middle, uh, parallel for subgroups, which um, lets execution of a, uh, of a code once per uh, vector of work items. It, it's quite interesting and powerful um, tool. Um, the other thing, which is slightly related, is uh, SQL collective um, operations, which is encapsulations of uh, OpenCL 2.0 um, functionality. Um, and it covers um, the, the operations like broadcast, reduce, scan. Um, it possibly is doing something very similar it would be possible with the previous feature, but this one is, is well defined and um, already used by OpenCL 2.0. Um, so yeah, uh, and, uh, another thing, very, very interesting, is um, SQL shared uh, virtual memory, SVM. So um, at the moment, in current um, generation of OpenCL, moving the data, complex data uh, types, um, from host to device memory is, is a little bit of a pain. A lot of uh, code, et cetera, et cetera, um, um, needs, needs to be uh, developed and make sure that you can actually do that. Uh, with SVM, these things can be way, uh, way more easier, where we're basically using the same um, virtual layer of a memory. Um, and depending on um, the, um, the OpenCL device capabilities, we can distinguish uh, two different flavors of it. Um, coarse green SVM and fine green SVM. Um, coarse green is um, quite similar to something we've got just now on, um, on SQL 1.2, where um, the underlying uh, pointer is, is the same for host and for the device, but you still want to use um, the uh, accessors to make sure that the data is uh, consistent. The fine grain, on the other hand, is, is a little bit more, um, well, it doesn't use um, accessors for a starter, but it needs, uh, we need to register accesses uh, so as you can see, there's a register access on, on the pointer, and then we can use the pointer inside our uh, single task um, as, a, as a row pointer. Or, well, as a, um, and depending on the um, ava uh, availability of atomics, the loads and the stores on that uh, OpenCL uh, capable devices can be um, atomic. So yeah, um, I would like to um, bring up the first uh, use case, TensorFlow. Um, that's something that I've been working on as a toy project and it's like blow up to, to actually project. Uh, so TensorFlow um, is, a, is the um, machine learning and deep neural network framework by Google. Um, and um, we probably all heard about what, what, what the neural network's situation is at the moment and where it's heading. Um, but what we, what not all of us can know is underneath of, of the, um, of the neural network, which is designed by a neural network architect, there's a heavy calculations um, performed. Um, and this, per, uh, this, coming back to where SQL fits in a, an ecosystem, this is a very good example of that, where we have this very big project which has multiple, not only um, big projects in it, but as well uses different, um, different programming languages, different models, uh, we've got a, a an Aigen C++ template library for a linear al algebra, which um, seems like you know something manageable, um, less to worry about. Uh, so what happens there is we've got this, this big uh, neural network, and um, the layers of, of that neural network are represented as a expression tree, um, which then is uh, encapsulated in a type and evaluated on on a device. Um, templates obviously helping with that. Uh, so what we did um, with a SQL is we created the backend for for a Aigen, which can actually evaluate um, this, these expressions on a OpenCL devices. It's still work in the progress, but it's, it's just first step. It's quite an important step. Um, there are two links. Uh, if anyone would like to help, that would be awesome. Um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about is um, 
another use case is uh, SQL Parallel STL, which was mentioned before. Uh, Parallel uh, STL is an implementation of technical spe uh, specification for C++ extensions for parallelism. It's basically a list of parallel, uh, well-defined functions. Um, it's hosted on the Kronos uh, repository. Um, we, did, we, we basically ported that to SQL, uh, so we've got some subset of, um, of, the, of these functions implemented, um, ported. Um, and as you can see, um, the syntax is very similar to, to normal STL. It's just passing in the, the execution policy. It's, again, the, the work in progress. So, yeah, I've sprinted through this presentation. <laughs> but, yeah, so thank you for your time. And these are some links. And uh, I'll pass the microphone to Matthias. Thank you. So, so we've had the overview of what um, OpenCL and Circle and Sphere are. Now we're going to hear three more presentations from people implementing and actually some demos and examples of how people use uh, uh, OpenCL. So ha happy to welcome uh, um, Pockel. Is that how you pronounce it, right? Pockel. Yes. Matthias. So thanks for the introduction. <coughs> My name is Matthias Koskola. I'm from Tampere University of Technology, and I'm here to talk to you about POCL, which stands for Portable Computing Language. So what is POCL? It's MIT licensed open source implementation of the OpenCL standard. It has portable code base and kernel compiler and it supports both homogeneous CPUs and heterogeneous GPUs, TSPs and accelerators. And it uses up, upstream Clang as an OpenCLC front end, and it uses LLVM for the kernel compiler implementation and as a portability layer. So it has custom LLVM passes for uh, single program, multiple data model to multiple instruction, multiple data model. And it also takes care of special things like the work distribution and the barriers and so forth. Uses of Pockle. Why you should use Pockle? First of all, it's used to get OpenCL support on new devices. So only thing you need to have is the LLVM backend. And for example, Carl Ray utilizes Pockle for their many cores. Texas Instruments, DSPs, they use Pockle kernel compilation passes. And MIPS CPUs receive OpenCL support via Pockle. And there can be also others we just don't know because we are open source and anyone can download the code. Pockle is also used as a resource platform. So there's a tool called TCE, which can be used to generate processors and they receive OpenCL support via Pockle. Then there's some research on high level synthesis of FPGAs and some research on performance portability of GPU kernels to CPUs and DSPs. <laughs> And it also can be used as an open source alternative to vendor SDKs. So if the vendor SDK doesn't support older device, Pockle can support that. And also open source means transparency. So if you are optimizing your code, you can actually see what the SDK is doing and it can help you. Uh, recent work on Pockle. So there's now Pockle HSA driver. Um, so it's, it means open OpenCL support for HSI-based devices. And this is funded by HSS, HSI Foundation. Then there's work on Pockle CUDA driver. And the idea is to have efficient and transparent OpenCL for NVIDIA GPUs and the work is led by James Price. Then, as a recent work, we have improved the offline compilation. So 
if you have a mobile device with not that powerful CPU, you can do the compilation offline. Future work. So we are seeking for OpenCL standard compliance, and we are looking for helping hands and resources for this. 1.2 is very close. There are some not that commonly used functionalities missing, like some image types. Uh, 2.x is a bit farther. Uh, in the future, we are also going to improve the kernel compiler's workgroup auto vectorization. We are going to have a standard hardware interface to run kernels, and we are going to further improve the execution of heterogeneous command queues, meaning uh, multiple different types of accelerators of GPUs on the same context. So what you should remember from my talk is that POCL is a MIT licensed open sale implementation. And if you became interested, you can check the official POCL paper and go to portablecl.org or come to our IRC channel on all ftc.net. Thank you. And I'm going to hand it over to guys from Quagum. Hi, my name is Alex Burt. I'm uh, from Adrena GPU team for Qualcomm, uh, the right shirt. And I have also, also happened to be OpenCL uh, API spec editor. So just want to introduce a couple of demos we're going to show. Um, basic message uh, for me today is that Qualcomm loves OpenCL. We were participating in OpenCL Kronos Group since 2008, almost from the very beginning. Uh, we were one of the first uh, to implement OpenCL mobile devices, and we are the first, as Neil mentioned, to implement OpenCL 2.0. So we have millions of devices in the field and shipping with different versions of OpenCL from embedded all the way to full profile and OpenCL 2.0 support. Uh, we have SDK, we have development boards. Uh, so if you're interested in OpenCL mobile, Qualcomm would be a great place to start your experiments. Okay, uh, my portion is uh, to talk about Qualcomm's Snapdragon Neural Processing Engine, SNPE. It's pronounced Snappy. It provides a runtime for the execution of deep neural networks. These networks can perform a range of classification tasks and are particularly well suited for image recognition tasks, whether that's classification of an entire image, object detection at a bounding box level, or labeling at a fine grain level, as is done by a semantic segmentation network. Unlike its more famous cousins, CAFE and TensorFlow, Snappy is not a training framework. It provides a forward pass inference engine only. Provided as part of the engine is an optimized OpenCL based GPU runtime, which is capable of real time performance for some models. So here we have the performance of Snappy for three models. AlexNet and GoogleNet are well known publicly available models. QC Scenes is a lower complexity model which was developed for Qualcomm Scene Detect product. These are roughly in order of execution efficiency. AlexNet um, to calculate a forward pass of AlexNet, it takes 724 million multiply and accumulates, or just under 1.5 gigaflops. AlexNet was the winner of the uh, ImageNet 2012 competition, which kicked off the current deep, lear deep learning revolution. It makes heavier use of fully connected layers than is more common with more modern networks. Fully connected layers constrain performance somewhat due to the number of weights that they contain. GoogleNet, um, was the winner of the ImageNet 2014 competition. It, um, a four pass of it involves 1.5 billion multiplying accumulates or three uh, gigaflops. And the Qualcomm Scenes network is uh, 500, 500 million multiplying accumulates or one gigaflop, and it's the model that's used for Qualcomm Scene and Tech product and is, the, and is the network for which our model was most highly optimized. So some brief description of our um, you know, main demo. If there's extra time, I'll do a second demo. The car detector model um, running on Snappy um, runs inside of an Android app. Um, some information about the model here. It's two, point, sorry, it's two billion max or um, four gigaflops. The forward um, propagate time is 53 milliseconds. 
And what you'll see for the model output is a bounding box and uh, heat map information. So as you go, this goes, what's being, being displayed on the laptop that you can't see is actually just a raw video of a driving scene. And what's being output is this heat map information of the highest activations of the network and a bounding box corresponding for the car. It's important to note that there are no um, computer vision optimization techniques being used here. This, um, each frame that you see, each um, you know, update of the bounding box, each new heat map represents a full forward pass of the network. And it does um, pretty well for cars from behind and uh, cars that are close enough to the uh, camera to be you know, large enough. I think I'll show the other demo here quickly too, just to you know contrast with another another deep learning network um, situation that we can do. Okay, so can you just sort of show this one at a time? Sure. Okay, so for this model, it's doing a detection of the scene that it's seen. Um, it may get some incorrect results because we have, you know, photographs and this is indoor lighting. Um, but as you switch from, you know, one to another, which I can do here. Let's see, let's do something interesting. This should probably show architecture, I hope. This will probably show text. Yep. Food. So in this case, it's not doing bounding box. It's not doing. Um, it's not doing any sort of heat map. It's just classifying the entire scene. But it is still operating, um, you know, very quickly. So that if we toss a new picture in front of it, it quickly detects what the new picture is. Okay. That's the essence of the demo. Uh, of course, it's all OpenCL accelerated. Yes. I mentioned that earlier, but it, it should be emphasized it's all based on OpenCL. This is all on OpenCL GPU runtime. All right, so I'm going to demonstrate a couple of new features of our um, latest version of our OpenCL SDK and specifically some of the code builder tools. And I um, really wanted to demonstrate the, the Spear V support that we've added because I think that's. Uh, most relevant to the, the newer versions of OpenCL and some of these latest talks. So uh, our latest version of the SDK that you can go down and, and get publicly, it does have Spear V support. Uh, that includes a Spear V generator, uh, an integrated Spear V disassembler. Uh, and both of these tools have been leveraging the Kronos open source work extensively. So, um, you know, We've just kind of wrapped it up and, and provided it in a, a familiar tool chain. Um, it, it's essentially under the hood. It's, it's all of the Kronos tools, and, and thanks to Kronos and all of the contributors for doing that. Um, we've also provided in our latest SDK uh, a, an experimental runtime. Um, it's, it's obviously not production quality, but uh, it does uh, export OpenCL 2.1 and the OpenCL 2.1 entry points, and it does consume Spear V. Uh, so you can at least try out some uh, OpenCL 2.1 features and uh, Spear V consumption um, while we're waiting for more OpenCL 2.1 implementations to hit the market. So I'm going to go through the slides fast because the demo is the interesting part. But um, if you're familiar with IOC, the Intel Offline Compiler, uh, it has been extended. There's new command line options to output uh, Spear V 32-bit binaries, Spear V 64-bit binaries, and their text equivalents. If you use uh, Code Builder through the Visual Studio IDE, uh, that's been extended to uh, support Spear V, and that's what we're going to do in the demo. Uh, and if you want to walk through what I'm doing at home, uh, we do have a Spear V sample. Uh, it's, you can get the source code. You can get the, um, once you've installed the SDK, you can just open it up, and, and you can essentially do what I'm going to do right now. Uh, there is a link there. But I also just checked that if, I think if you Google search Spear V Intel, it'll be the first link. So it should be pretty easy to find. All right. So good. 
Okay, so um, this is the project that you would get if you uh, downloaded that sample. Um, and if you open it up in Visual Studio, you'd see that you have an OpenCL kernel. Uh, and this is a, a code builder enabled project. So if you right click on this guy and you say properties, it should bring up a bunch of OpenCL code builder properties. Uh, you can define which device you would like to target. Uh, you can see I'm targeting the experimental 2.1 platform right now. There's a bunch of options for what you want to generate, and I've got the options set to generate Spear V 32 bit and Spear V 64 bit. You can pick whichever ones you want. Um, so the first thing is if I just build this guy right now, as part of the build step, you'll see that it's processing the Sobel kernels kernel. Uh, it's built them, um, and uh, this actually has generated the, the, the Spear V files for that kernel. We can also do this through a code builder session. So what I'm gonna do here is just call this kernels. And I'm gonna point this at the same kernel file. And what this is gonna do is bring up this code builder session explorer and now I can build this session and this is doing a similar thing. It's going off and it's building actually all of the Spear V files, all the Spear files. Um, it's going to give you some assembler versions, uh, and it's also going to give you the text equivalent. So you can see it's generated both of the Spear V files here, and it's also generated their text equivalent. And um, if you open this up, it should look a lot like the Spear V file that Ralph was demonstrating earlier. Um, last but not least, I can run this thing. So uh, this is a, a Sobel filter. Um, what it's gonna do is it's gonna take this picture of a dog and it's gonna run a Sobel filter on it. So, um, this is running on the CPU device. Uh, these are not particularly optimal kernels. They're more for demonstration, so this may take a little bit. And you can see while it's running it, uh, it did build it from Spear V. Um, it did detect the Spear V kernels and it's building it from the, spilt, the Spear V file that we generated earlier. I'm gonna kill this. There's actually three different versions of, in this, in, of the Sobel kernel here, but. And you can see it did generate a, a Sobel dog. So that's the code builder. Um, I think we have a little bit of time. I wanted to do one more demo. Uh, this one I'm hoping is gonna work because we were literally working on it up until this morning. Uh, this is an example that uses the C++ kernel language compiler. Um, I have a C++ kernel here. It's kind of a toy kernel. It doesn't do anything particularly interesting, but it is a C++ kernel. Uh, and when I build this guy, it should go off and compile with the open source Clang and um, the open source disassembler and generate a Spear V file with it. And if I run it, this does generate a Julia set picture. So um, just a demonstration that you can go end to end from the open source uh, Spear V compiler the C++ Spear V compiler, you can execute it on our experimental runtime and it will work. Uh, this isn't a public sample yet, so if people want to try this at home, come by and let me know. And I've got some, uh, this, this was a bit of a bumpy process. If you do want to check me, see that I'm honest, I can edit this kernel and rebuild it and it should be a Sobel, or sorry, a, a, a fractal just with some different colors now. So, so that's it. That's. Uh, Spear V and OpenCL C++ running on the experimental runtime that we provided in our latest SDK. All right. I think I was too forceful saying everyone had to finish on time. You've actually finished early. <laughs> so we have lots of time for Q&A. So um, we invite any of the speakers to, to join us and um, feel free to 
ask questions for any of the speakers that you heard. Um, does anyone have any questions? Please. Hi. Um, so you said um, you, at least in, oh, towards the end, I saw you used open source Clang compiler for the Windows. Uh, for example, does it work with the Microsoft sub, uh, extension with the Visual Studio that ha they have their own Clang that uh, in integrates with Visual Studio? Does it work with that too? So it, it's a it's a Kronos version of Clang. It, it has the, uh, the the Spear V to LLVM bidirectional converter. So the the LLVM top of tree, the, the, the version that's checked into the LLVM repository doesn't have that functionality, so it, it wouldn't work with that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, the demo for uh, the pedestrian detection. Can you run it on the audience? He, he asked if we could run it on the audience. Yes, I, I, I could have. I sh probably should have. It would have shown people. Yeah, but the, the one trick is the lighting. So on, I would have probably wanted to step off the stage so that it wasn't blinded by the spotlight. But, but I, can, I, can, I can run it for you like right after you know this. Anyone who wants to walk up, I can show you. Go ahead. So this is probably more for the um, desktop guys and the mobile guys, but as a, you know average Joe developer that you know, would like to use Sickle and C++ and, and their code base, I mean, how do I, it, it seems to me that the promise of heterogeneous computing Cross devices is a bit short right now because I can't really use OpenCL 2.1 or even 2.2 .2 on, uh, I guess, Intel, but not on a NVIDIA or AMD, and I can't really get to Sickle yet. So, uh, does the working group have any idea about how to coerce or convince vendors <laughs> to implement this stuff so that we can use it? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what I was expecting to hear. But yeah, that's, well, it's a pipeline. You know, you have to get the specs and it flows through. So there is obviously a, a delay. But um, it comes down to developers asking for it. Really, that is the thing that will change, change minds and makes things happen faster if, uh, if developers you know, make sure that you know, the, the companies understand. And you know, I'm happy to take feedback. And, but if you know any, anyone else in the video, you know, harangue them. It's, um, uh, it's, it's just a straightforward calculation. If developers want it, then it, then it becomes valuable to, to do it. Okay. So, but I, I do agree. We need to kind of get over the hump into the 2.x two, the two being widely available. So. How about Mac? So Apple, so for example, can't Intel provide SDKs for Apple? At least for the CPU. <laughs> well. Yeah, there is a request. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, I can't really say much there, but it, you know, the, you should take that request to Apple. Um, and, and I think Neil's comment about if enough developers ask for it, then people start to listen. I mean, also Apple is, has some focus on metal right now. Hi. But, uh, yeah, but again, you know, developer focus is, is good. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, could you please uh, give us some uh, very brief notes about profiling uh, OpenCL, like which tools to use on which platforms, and uh, just a quick introduction to profiling? I, I can answer that question from Intel, at least. Uh, Vtune, which you use for profiling host CPU code, will also support profiling OpenCL code, both on CPUs and GPUs. Yeah, and uh, is there any, like, really free tool? Because Vtune is not free, it's uh, There's a, commercial. There is tool. a trial version of Vtune, I believe. Yeah, so for 30 days. Uh, but, uh, yeah. you know, uh, is, is there any, like, really free tool for doing it? That's a great request. <laughs> <laughs> Should be in politics. So I, keep, I, can, I can add. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So CallConf has Adena profiler and it's absolutely free and it supports OpenCL. So it's part of our SDK. I keep thinking Victor's asking a question over there. I keep looking over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other any other questions?